tonight this message is called Revive a Generation. And that's what we're going to do, and we're going to pray that tonight that God revives you, that he is going to revive the calling upon you, and he's going to revive the things that's within you. And I just really feel some big things. And see, here's the thing. When you really get on fire for God, you have no idea how many people that's going to impact. You have no idea how many pastors and ministers and, and worship leaders and school teachers and coaches that had a tyrant moment in their life where they were like, should I serve God or not? And all of a sudden they made a decision to serve the Lord. And how many lives have they impacted? Now, how many people out there in the world that are impacting people in a negative way from the devil? And there was a time in their life when they had to make a choice. Do I serve God or not in this city? Well, I just believe that every time we come together on a Thursday night, that things are going to happen, that things are going to change. And this is what I feel. Tonight, I'm going to talk to you about a selfish generation. I mean, your generation is very selfish. And I want to talk to you about just whenever things can be dark, the church needs to just rise up and speak the greatest truth to God. You have the greatest opportunity to make a huge change in your college, your school, your job, and your family, and everything. So tonight, I just want us to pray, and I want you just to just ask God to just soften your heart and the truth of the word that he has for you. So Father God, I just pray that tonight you just soften our hearts. Lord, your servants are listening. Lord, I just pray that you just speak to our hearts, Lord Jesus. Just speak to us to the things that we need. And God, I just thank you for all that you're doing in our lives tonight. In your mighty name, amen. All right. First part for tonight. This is in Genesis 49. This is when Jacob's talking to his son Reuben. He says, Reuben, you are my firstborn, my, my, my and beginning of my strength. And what he's basically saying is this. He says, you have my birthright. You have a gift upon you. You are called. You are called this great mighty thing. You have all of this set up for you. And the thing is, he didn't want it. He didn't act like it. And the, the scripture goes on to say, Reuben, you are just like water. You're going to perform beneath whatever you're around and in whatever you do. Does this make sense to you? How many people are like that? There are so many people that I know that are in and out of church and in and out of the connection, but it's 
one that can also says this. Turn away my eyes from looking at worthless things and revive me in your way. How many people need to do that tonight? You need to turn your eye away from things that you should be looking at. This is a thing of honor. That means the things of the lust, the things of the flesh. So many times we can run after the things of the flesh. And what they're crying out to the Lord is, please God, revive me because I need you so much more. I need everything you have for me. And that's what we should pray is that we have the Lord just revive our hearts. Acts 4 and 13, it says this. I love this scripture. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. It's talking about Peter and John. There was a lame man under the gate, beautiful. He just walked up and said, hey, can I have some silver? Can I have some gold? Can I have some denarius and something? And, and they said, silver, go have some. We don't have any. So they came back to Jesus and they grabbed him and took something and they killed him. You know, we need to have that. But this is what happened. It says, now they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, but they marveled, and they confessed their sins to Jesus. Now, let me just explain that deception style. They can, Peter and John were good old boys. And it says, they perceived they had not been to Bible college, they had not been to seminary, but they marveled because they could tell that they read and prayed and worshipped Jesus on a daily basis. And they could tell that they filled with the Lord. And that's what it is. It's about reading and praying. And I tell you about this, your generation, they want the power and the miraculous signs and the wonders of Jesus without accountability. It happens all the time. You see people that I've seen people that listen to more podcasts or the more they preach and love everything about Jesus and will not be accountable for, to anybody for anything. I've got some cat talking one day and he said, Dude, you're not going to believe this. The Lord just gave me a word. I had a guy one time that said, hey, I want you to check me up on, on a sexual sin. And I said, really? And, and he said, yeah. I said, all right, I'll, I'll call you on a regular basis and we'll talk about it. And you know what? He said, the reason I quit that sexual sin is because I was too embarrassed every day. Uh, Pastor Joe, I looked at pornography today. He said, I wanted to. And I would just, I would go to that computer and I'd want to, but I thought Pastor Joe's going to ask me if I looked at pornography. And I didn't want to tell him yes, but I didn't do it. You know, hey, however the Lord wants to deliver you, it's good. You know, but when you're accountable to somebody, they can pray for you over that situation. They can pray for you over something. Do you not think you're worth, your life is worth being accountable to somebody? I want you to know, wherever you go to church on Sunday morning, you can walk in. Men, you can you can find older men, women, you can find older women. That, if you walk up to them and say, hey, we hold me accountable? Man, they will cook you more chicken dinners, lemon icebox pies. They they love that. And, you know, there's been times that I walked up to men and I said, hey, would, would you use those sins of time and mention me? And they're like, me? You want me to mention you? And I'm like, yeah, man. I just And just spend some time with me. And man, they carry me out to lunch and treat me all good, and I like it. Because we all need somebody in our life. We need somebody to come in. And I love
love this. One day I was walking through our church, and you know Brother Mel Gosser, he's, he's a, a leader in our church, and he walks up and says, hey, Pastor Joe, how's it going? I said, good. He goes, get in here. And he pushed, put me in a room, and for like 15 minutes, he just started praying for me and, and just speaking life into me. And, and I said, man, I was just busy, you know, Brother Mel, and I just, you know, I just didn't really enjoy the way I had going on in my life. I'm tired. I've got a lot going on. And he said, because I love you, I pray for you, and I know you. And there was another time that a leader at our church did the same thing. I was walking by, and I just have a catchphrase. I, I said, how's your thing going? Things are great. And I was kind of walking on, and they said, get in my office. And I walked in there, and they just prayed for me and loved on me for about 15, 20 minutes, and it changed my life. Because the Bible says this, that a person's eyes are the very window of their soul. And if you know somebody, that's why a lot of people don't come to the connection when they had done messed up, because they said, everybody there knows me. Because we all want to go what? You want to sing the theme song for Cheers? We all want to go where everybody knows my name. So when they walk in, they're like, they could tell that I had messed up. And I said, well, if you don't show up, we know you, you messed up because you don't go to college and you get off work at 5, and there's no reason you shouldn't be here. So back on the lecture at hand, there was a time that I was doing kind of like some family counseling, and, and there was this is the craziest thing, but catch this was good. There was a, a quarrel between a mother and her three children. And what happened, and I said, so what's going on? And the oldest child said, well, I'll speak up. Got pregnant in high school. And when I got pregnant, I told my mom, and my mom was crying, and she was disappointed, and she was heartbroken. And, and she said, what are we going to do? You're, you're smart. You're, you, know, you need to go to college. It's going to cost me a lot of money, and, but I'm going to do whatever I have to do to get you to school and to take care of the baby. And so it was just all this work, and it was just harsh on the family, and it was real hard. Then the second child said, same thing happened to me. I got pregnant, and it was hard, and my mom was crying, and her heart was broken. And, you know, and sometimes, in a way, it can be embarrassing to, you know, a family. And the mom would say, you know, I, th I thought I raised them better. And I said, well, don't hold anything personally. Just they had a weak moment or something. They messed up. And it was hard on them. It was, I was like, oh, this is getting heavy in here. And then the third child was sitting there, and they're like, well, I got married. And three years later, I had a child. And they're like, and that's the problem. And I'm like, well, what's the problem? They said, because when they, we found out that she was pregnant, mama caught all her friends. They got the shower host. They got these cute little cards with polka dots and all this, and they started inviting all their friends. And mama got so excited for her baby, and we're like, mama. Oh, her first child has two kids now, not married. So they said, you've got three kids, three grandkids. Why are you happy all of a sudden over four? And mama, don't lie, mama told them, because it's the first one that wasn't created in, in sin. And I was like, Jesus, what a dork. <laughs> and she told him that, and I was like, I said, well, mother has a good point. And they're like, but that's not, it doesn't matter. It's her grandchild. I said, but what mama had said was it was, the, now she loves your grand, her grandkids, but she was excited about this. And I said, why are you upset? They said, because she wasn't excited about mine. I said, she was, but she was hurt at the same time. And sometimes in your generation, you may hurt somebody's feelings, and it doesn't really bother you. Somebody had called the other day and said there was this, uh, it was sad, but they said there was this girl, I think she was like 15 years old on Facebook, and she said, what's the big deal? I'm pregnant. It's not a big deal. I'll just go to school, and my parents can take care of the baby. And that was, and they said, you know, what's this generation coming to? And I'm like, I don't know. I just keep preaching on Thursday and hope things change. And the thing was, that's how this generation sees things. You know, you get on Facebook and, and somebody gets pregnant and they're not married, everybody rejoices. They rejoice in your sin. Good job. And they rejoice in that. You know, there is a generation that is confused out there. You know, there comes, I remember, and you don't understand where I'm coming from on a lot of this, because parents come and bawl and they weep and they cry and their hearts are broken. And they get on Facebook and see everybody rejoicing in that. I had a friend of mine call me one time and say, hey, man. I'm having a housewarming party. Me and my girl were ha bought us a house. I'm like, dude, you just, your divorce isn't final. Now, this is the one. I said, what about the other three? Now, this is the one. We're having a housewarming. And he got mad because I wouldn't come to their housewarming party. Brother's still married. So another girl. This was a different one. And see, sometimes people are, are confused by that. 1 Corinthians 14 and 33 say this. God is not the author of confusion, but he is the author of peace. 
And so many times I look at people in your generation and I don't see the peace of God, the peace of God that passes all understanding, the peace of God that when you lay your head down and not yet peace in your life, if you do not have peace when you lay your head down, there is a reason. And you should ask the Lord, God, what's wrong? What, what's wrong inside of me? What, why does I don't have peace? You're not the author of confused. I feel a little confused. That's when you call somebody. That's when you call a leader. That's when you call somebody that can walk you through things in life. Do you know why my wife and I do what we do? Do you know why the leaders of the connection, why they're leaders, why they spend so many hours doing small groups and things? Because we believe in you and we believe in your generation. And we believe that you can do great and mighty exploits and great things for the Lord. And you know, it's a fact. This is a, a very powerful stat. I'm sure a lot of you have heard it. But four generations ago, 65% of that generation claimed to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Three generations ago, it dropped down to 35%. Two generations ago, my generation was at 15%, and your generation is 4%. The generation of my children is predicted to be less than 2% of their generation is going to claim to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Anything less than 2% is considered a lost people group. That is when other nations start sending missionaries to that country. So if things do not change, by the time my children get to be your age, missionaries will be coming into America, the most powerful nation in the world. It's time for a change, and it's time that we revive a generation. And you know, it all starts with you. You know, I was reading some stats today about college-age students, 18 to 25. 75% of college students drink at least one alcoholic beverage a week. Is that not amazing? You know, it also says that 25% of them get drunk on a weekly basis. And then you got things like, you know, drinking and marijuana. You know, 90% of people who do cocaine at first drink alcohol or marijuana. They shouldn't start off with cocaine. And, you know, I'm going to talk about sex for a minute. 19%, 19 million new sexually transmitted infectious cases are formed every year. Half of them are 18 to 25. So if you're not good in math, it's 9.5 million new sexually transmitted diseases. And you know, this, this broke my heart one time. I was at a, a conference in Dallas, and, and I, 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 was, I was ministering, and this kid on the side was just, just weeping profusely. And he was a good-looking young man. He's 20 years old. He was all bowed up. You can tell he goes to the gym, and he, he had a cool shirt and nice hair and all this. And he was just crying. And I was like, this cat's going to come over here. And you know, I motioned for him. I said, come here, dude. And he walked over, and he was just crying. And I said, what's wrong? He said, I don't understand. He said, I've only had sex with two people in my life. The first time when I was probably about 17 years old, I had sex with one girl three times. And then I broke it off because I felt convicted. Well, about a year and a half ago, I had a girlfriend. We went out for like a year, and I gave in because she was pressuring me. I know it's kind of different from, you know, what usually happens. But so I gave in. We only had sex like 10 times. And he said, come to find out, she had HIV. And so I broke it off. My heart was broken. And she said she just didn't have the heart to tell me, but she loved me. And then the guy, he's pretty sharp. He goes, she really didn't love me because she didn't tell me. And I said, correct. And then he said, then I, have, I fell in love with the most wonderful girl I've ever met. And she is a Christian. We have a standard. He said, we don't even kiss. We've been dating for six months, and she's the one. And I'm like, okay. He said, but then she said, why won't you even kiss me? And that's as far as, why won't you even kiss me? Why won't you even touch me? And then now I have to tell her that I have HIV. And he said, I've only had sex 13 times in my life, which for some of y'all it's a lot. For some of you, unfortunately, it's not. But he said, you know, only two people in my life I've had sex with. And now for the rest of my life, what am I going to do? Am I ever going to be able to get married? Do I have to live alone for the rest of my life? And this guy said, I, I just messed up two times. For the rest of his life, he's going to do a single. That's what he said. He said his mind's 20 years old. He said, I go to work, I do college, and I work out, and I go home and I weep every single night because I was stupid for the rest of his life. Now he has to go tell his parents because his parents were like, well, what's wrong with you? She's a great girl. She's pretty. Well, why don't you ask her to marry you? And he's like, I can't. And he said, you're the only person that knows. And I'm like, well, first of all, you need somebody to hold you accountable. You need to talk to somebody about this. You know, isn't that sad that somebody's in that situation for the rest of their life? You know, and this is the sad thing. Did you know one in every four college students has a sexually transmitted disease? Now, there's a lot of college students, like myself, that's married. We good because they test you. So let's just knock that down to about half of the um, 
one out of every two or one out of every three people on your campus have a sexually transmitted disease. Now, here's the thing. They say 95% of college students say this. Oh, I can pick somebody that has an STI. It's somebody with an infection. Did you know they pulled a bunch of people up on that and got a bunch of smart college students? Because college students are smart. And they said, now pick the people who has an STD or an STI. And they did really good. 20%. They made a 20 on the test. You cannot tell. And somebody who's infected sometimes will not even show up for the first two years if you have it. Why in the world would you take a chance gambling with the rest of your life? Because inside of marriage, there is great joy. Having kids is a great joy. You would never want to throw that away. And then you would want to infect other people. You know, this is a day and a time and a season that people need to really wake up and, and, and revive the call of God that's in their life and set yourself apart. And young ladies, there's a lie that you believe, and I'm going to preach this until the day that I die, that you do not have to give in before marriage because there is a godly man out there that is waiting to see a princess up there that's going to set herself apart. And there is going to come a day that there's going to be guys that will walk up, and they're waiting for that. You know, this is the funny thing. I have young guys that say, Pastor Joe, I just don't see a lot of girls set themselves apart, and, and I'm setting myself apart, and I'm looking for those girls. These girls say, Miss Autumn, we're setting ourselves apart. Where are the guys? And I'm like, we're not having a dance or nothing. So <laughs> maybe in a few years, the Lord will get them all together and, and, and it'll work out. And I'll just do a bunch of weddings. We can just line them up and we'll do a bunch of weddings when I hear the connection, whatever. But Second Chronicles 7:14 it says, If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. And this is talking about seeking the face of God, not the hand of provision, not the hand of blessing. Please pay for my college, Lord. I messed up and I didn't get a scholarship not his hand, his face. Oh God, use me in a great and a mighty way. I'll do whatever you've called me to do. I'll go wherever you send me. The Lord is looking for people who will humble themselves and seek his face. Now, how many people here are humble? Three. Awesome. Three humble people, one in the back. It's good. So, you know, you just need to humble yourself on a daily basis. And you know, every day when I wake up, I just simply say this. I just say, God, let me decrease and you increase in my life each and every day. And you know, the thing is, if you got people holding you accountable in life, they'll humble you. You know, there's times that I'll be walking with young guys and I'll be like, why'd you look at that girl? I didn't look at that girl. We in the gym, there's a mirror. You just straight looked at her through the mirror. They're like, oh, Pastor Joe. You know, and you know, th that's humbling. You know, I've got people that, that they check me up all the time and hey, it's it uh, it's all right. But the, the question that, that I want to ask you is this. You know, the Bible says, from that scripture it goes then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive your sin and I will heal your land man this is time that our land in America needs to be completely spiritually healed who's going to stand up and do it who is going to stand up and honestly see their land healed completely restored I'm believing for it and and I ask you this where are the leaders where, where honestly where are the leaders in your generation are you going to be a leader are you going to do something? Or are you going to come to the connection until you're 31 and just keep on to, to, to preach, Pastor Joe, preach. I'll come listen to you forever. We'll learn something. You know, the Bible says that so many times we hear the word of God and we're, we're getting the truth, but we're not learning anything. God's wanting us to learn it and, and apply it, you know, to your life. This, this is what I'm going to let you in. What I, my, one of my secret prayers. Y'all ready for this? This is a secret. I've been praying that somebody, now just don't do it because I'm saying it, make sure it's in your heart, but that somebody would say, hey, I want to start a 7 a.m. prayer meeting and stick with it. I would love to see somebody say, hey, I want to start um, a prayer meeting. And I want to start a prayer meeting. I want to start just a fast. I want to start a 24-hour prayer chain. And people will be so hungry for the things of God that they'll say, I'll forerun this. Now, here's the thing that's true, but it's also it's a lie that the enemy says. A lot of you say, I don't want to lead my peers because nobody will follow me. Well, how do you know if you don't try leading? You know, if you go out there and you say, guys, follow me, and you take off and nobody follows you, that means there's a reason. Then you come to leadership and we tell you why they're not following after you. And then we'll help you and you try it again. You know, 1 Timothy 3, it talks about this, that there'll be people of a good report. And, and I've had people say, Pastor Joe, I'll, I'll do anything in the connection. What do you need me to do? Be a leader and be of a good report. Don't be the ones that when I'm going down our prayer list, I was going down our prayer list this morning at 430 and I was praying, and then sometimes I stop and give extra attention to some people. And then some people I just kind of pray easy over. There's some that I stop and I camp out on. You know, I say, Jesus, help them today. But, you know, be a leader and just step up to that standard. 1 Corinthians 3, 
and 18 it says do not deceive yourself if any of you think that you are wise by your own standards of this age then you should become fools so that you may become wise and the thing is a lot of times people you set your standard of the ways of the world you may look around and say I got three friends and uh, I'm the most spiritual one well that doesn't matter you know I've, I've had people that they say well I'm the most spiritual person that I hang out with well get you some new friends and you know, I look at who you hang out with, and I see who you're, you know, the people that you hang out with, those people you're going to be like. And, you know, I ask a lot of our leaders, hey, who called you this week? Who wanted to hang out with you? Who wanted to spend some time with you? Who wanted to, to, to you know, iron sharpens iron? You know, people sometimes, they don't want to go to somebody that challenges them. You know, man, I put myself around people to challenge me. If you're the most spiritual person in your circle, find you a new circle. You're not, you're not going to grow. You know, sometimes when you start working out and you're the strongest person in your group, you know, sometimes you need to go around somebody smarter and stronger. Go work out with Big John. He's the strongest person I know. You know, dude benched 405 12 times without taking a break. That's a lot of weight. You know, Matthew 15, 8 says this. These people draw near to me with their mouth, and they honor me with their lips, and their hearts are far from me. You know, you see people all the time that are worshiping the Lord with everything that they got. They're worshiping the Lord, and they go and they live a contrary lifestyle. Well, let me tell you what happens. They're coming in here, and they feed the flesh. And this sounds crazy. They've just got the stuff of the world on them. Now, now this is good. I want you to grab a hold of this. They're coming in, and they got the world upon them because in the presence of the Lord, the mountains will melt away. It just melts away like when it's waxes. You come in, you're heavy. And worship just just comes in. The connection man always brings it on Thursday night. Do you know why they bring it on Thursday night? Because they live the life seven days a week. I know all four of them. They're amazing guys. And so you come in and you're heavy, and and the, the worship. And they come in. All of a sudden, you just feel good about yourself. But you know, you come in like this, and you honor the Lord with with, with your lip, lips. But your heart is so far from it. When I was a youth pastor, I had a little girl that would come in to youth. She had her boyfriend. They were fornicating, you know, not doing good stuff, a little bit of drug use too. And they would come in, and he would sit in the truck because he was a heathenistic sinner. And so she would come into the youth group, and she would sit there and, and worship. She would just, just praise Jesus, worship's over. She'd walk out and go get in the truck. And I, when I said, girl, where are you going? She said, my life is so hectic. I hate my life. I hate everything about it. But for 30 minutes a week, I can feel free. And I said, i got a secret about Jesus. He can set you free for good. And she's like, nah, not really interested, but I want that 30 minutes a week. And I said, then you keep coming back. And, you know, and it was just so sad because she could get set free for a moment. But the thing is, how many people honestly believe that? Okay, sometimes I ask questions to see what the answers I get. I'm always, I say to people, this, this is about praise and worship. I'm going to give you a three-minute lesson on praise and worship. It's going to be good. Please pay attention. I say, man, I'm so ready for praise and worship tonight at the connection. And people are like, oh, yeah, me too. Man, I've had a hard week. I just, just need to worship and just, just let the Lord just pour over me and, and, and sing over me. And, and I need Zach just to sing that right song. And I just need to get my whole day washed off of me. And I'm like, yeah, man, I, I love praise and worship because it's all about me, right? And they're like, well, what do you mean, Pastor Joe? I said, praise means we praise God. And worship means we worship God majority of people come into praise and worship to feel good why do people always say Zach I'll give you 20 bucks if you sing this song Zach what song you play hey Zach because they want that right song because when Kelly hits that right note and shreds that guitar and melts faces oh it just feels good in here praise the Lord I love it but the thing is who's bringing the praise and the worship is the band offering enough praise and worship to the Lord that there's that much presence in here? And I ask you this, during the, the praise and worship service, how many of you praise God and how many of you worship God or how many of you went through your prayer list with the Lord and how many of you honestly got up there and just said, God, my, my life's wretched, I need this and that, and God just, I just feel so good in the presence. Well, who is offering up the praise and the worship to the Lord to usher in the presence like that? Sometimes we become so selfish in a service. That part of the service is, man, you should be worshiping the Lord with everything that you've got. And, hey, I, I'll be honest. I love me some praise and worship because it feels good. But when I get into praise and worship, I just start thanking God. I, say, I just say, Lord, thank you for salvation. Thank you for my job. Thank you for my kids. Thank you for 
my, my wife being so much better looking than me. She's thanking for everything that you've given me. And I thank, I thank them for my family. I thank them for my friends. I thank them that my sister's sitting in the back. I thank them for everything. I just thank the Lord, and I just start worshiping. Sometimes I even cry and get emotional. And, you know, sometimes the presence is so strong. Man, that's a byproduct, and I love it. But I worship God, and I thank Him for everything that He's done for me. Do you ever stop to think about how good God is? I mean, do you just worship Him and praise Him? And that's what praise and worship is for. That's why we call it praise and worship. That's my little ditty on praise and worship. Psalms 119, 107 says this, I've committed myself, and I will never turn back. And that needs to be your prayer tonight. You need to say deep down in your heart, I have committed my life to God, and I will never turn back. There was a Kairos moment in my life where I was at a First Assembly of God on 7th Street in Texarkana, where I threw both hands up in the air, and I said, I will never turn my back, and I will never go back into the world. I said, I will never smoke, drink, fornicate, do drugs ever again, Lord, ever. I am running hard after you. And you know, when you say that, not out of your mouth, but out of your heart, you know, God honors that. And I just got so on fire for the Lord. And that fire is just growing and growing. And it goes on to say, you know, everything's falling apart on me, God. But you can all put it together again with your word. And the Bible says that people are destroyed for the lack of knowledge. What is knowledge? Knowledge is the word. Whenever you're going through anything in this world, any trial, any tribulation, the word of God can sustain you. Not an encouraging word for your friend. You know, before you pick up the phone when you're having a hard day and you call your friend, God's like, hey, right here I am. I got it. Just just holler at me. And you're calling your friends wanting to encourage your word. Man, you need to connect with the Lord. And after you connect with the Lord, you need to connect with a mentor, somebody that's going to bring it in your life. You know, and, you know, we just need to say just to God a lot, God, just revive me. Every week moment in my life, every week place. Psalms 119.37 and also says this, Turn away my eyes from looking at any worthless thing, anything worthless. You know, you can be so full of the power of God that all of, that when you're walking and you're looking at anything that's not of the Lord, the Holy Spirit can convict you, and you can just look. You can just walk away. That you can just walk away from anything, any vain imagination, no double looks. You know, you've seen the guys. You know why guys go to the chiropractor so much? Because they're walking and they, they double look and throw his neck out. Had a friend do it one time. Serious story. I'm like, sin hurts, son. We were at Six Flags, made them ride all the roller coasters. Get some. So, and the thing is, you know, we need to guard our heart. We need to guard our mind from all of that stuff. Isaiah 33, 15, it says this. This is the Message Bible. It says, the answer is simple. Live right. Speak the truth. You know, refuse bribes. Reject violence. Avoid all evil amusement. You know what I'm talking about. And it says, this is how you raise your standard of living. A safe and stable way to life. It's nourishing and it's satisfying. It's a satisfying way to live. That's what we should do at all times. We should try to raise our standard. You never set a standard when you're 19 or 20 and live that forever. You constantly raise it each and every day of your life. You just keep raising your standard, raising your standard, raising your standard. And the more that you raise your standard, the more that you live for God, the more fulfilled you are. When you start having God encounters, it will radically change your life forever. You'll be opening the Word of God, and you'll just, you can't even sit down when you read it. You just get so excited because the Word is coming alive because you know the author. You ever read a book, and you're just like, boring, because you don't know the author. I know who wrote this, and you start reading it, and it's like, because you have a personal relationship with them, it comes alive to you. And you're like, oh, Jesus, what you meant? I like this. And you just keep reading, and you're conversating with him. You're conversating with the author who wrote the book that you're reading, and it just starts speaking to your heart. Does that make sense? You're like, what? Okay, good. James 3 and 1, it says this. Don't be in any rush to become a teacher, a friend. Teaching is a high responsibility, and works for teachers will be held to a stricter standard. And that's what we should do. If you want to be a leader at the Connection or your church or wherever you work or whatever, you're going to be held to a higher standard. Live it. And here's the thing. Some people actually sneak some stuff past us, and they do some things that we don't catch. Well, you know, God's your judge. I'm not. But the thing is, you should be you should be set apart. You know, you should be set apart for your standard that you start living for the Lord, and you should hold a strict standard for your life. You know, I was, I heard a guy one day said, man, we're in the gym, and we're, you know, trying to get Swole Patrol on, doing arms or whatever, and people, they're watching Sports Center, and they quit working out, they're watching Sports Center on the screen. They said, man, can you imagine how much influence these pro athletes have? 
And I said, I ain't heard none of the guys on Sports Center. And they said, you know who those guys are? I'm like, no. I said, you ever thought if anybody sells out their life 100% for the things of God, no matter if they're ever on Sports Center or not, how much influence they can have in this world? I said, how many guys do you think have ever actually influenced anybody for the Lord? Do you think they work, are they being a pro baseball player for God or they've been a pro baseball player for the devil? And I said, how much influence will you have in your life? And I started challenging these guys. Sometimes I work out alone. But, you know, and, and I was just talking to them about, you know, selling out to the things, Lord. And anybody in here, did you know the most least popular person in your senior class, that person, I hope it wasn't you, the least popular person in your senior class will impact over 10,000 people before they die. Over 10,000 people. Now you, Mr. Mr. Popularity, you know, no matter how many people you can impact, if you sell out to the things of the Lord, people will want to be a part of you. It'll be around you. They just want to have what you have, and it's the Lord. You know, there's some people that I know that are Christians, excuse me, self-professing Christians. Nobody wants to be around them. Nobody. There's a reason. The thing is, when you completely sell out to the things of the Lord, man, you're going to have so much influence and, and just so, so much power in the Lord, and people are going to be drawn to you. Here, here's some good scriptures on this. Psalms 1 and 3. It says, He shall be like a tree planted in a river of water that brings forth fruit in the season. Whoever leaves also shall not wither, and whatever he does shall prosper. Now let me break this down. He is like a tree planted by the river of water which means when you're planted, you're going to grow. Are you planted in a church? There's a lot of good churches in Texarkana. There's a lot of good churches that you can grow in. When you're planted and you start to grow, you're going to produce fruit. And then it says, you know, you're going to produce fruit when it's your right season. And there's going to be a time that God brings you to a point, and he says, now's your season. And then it goes, whose leaves shall not wither. It's talking about ever. You may not be producing fruit at all times, but you're not going to wither. You're not going to go away. And then it goes on to say, and whatever he does shall prosper. When you start seeking the Lord and you're planted, one of the best things you can do is you can support another person's vision. I ask our senior pastor often, how can I help you? Is there anything I can do? Is there just something I can do to help you? Just something little, let me take it off your plate. You know, what is it? Because when you help supporting other people's vision, you know, that's what God blesses that. God, God just, he looks down on that and he likes that. So you need to be planted somewhere. You need to be able to start producing fruit because you can have the best plants, tree, whatever in the world. If they're not rooted, they're not going to grow anywhere. You can have the prettiest Japanese maple. I love those things. The best Japanese, well, they don't produce fruit, but they're pretty, right? So you got this beautiful tree, and if it's not planted somewhere, it's not going to grow. It's just going to die. It has to be planted and you need to allow your roots to go deep in some church and support that church. Jeremiah 18, 17 and 8, it says this, He shall be like a tree planted by the water, which spreads out its roots by the river. It means they're home. And you know when a tree's roots go deep, a tornado can come, a, a tsunami or whatever, a hurricane, and those trees will just flap. And when it stops, they stand straight back up because they're planted. And that's why being in the house of the Lord, submitted to a church and a church leadership is, when you're planted and the storms of life come, you got people that's going to help you. And you got people that's going to be there. And that's why we need to be planted. And it goes on to say, when the roots are, are spread deep throughout the, the river, when they're spread deep throughout the ground, they will not fear when heat comes, and its leaves will always be green. And it will not be anxious in the year of drought, nor it will cease to yield its fruits. Even in the dry times, when you're planted, you're going to be there with the Lord, and you're going to stay you're going to stay good. You're going to stay responsible and be planted somewhere. 1 Corinthians 3 and 18. Please understand this. Catch this. Do not deceive yourself. If any of you think that you are wise by your own standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. What standard do you live? Do you have a leader that you look up to in whatever they do? You do. If the Holy Spirit's checking you up on something they're doing, get you a new leader. Come talk to me. I will give you somebody. Or do you set yourself up on a standard to somebody that you respect, somebody that you, that you admire? You know, the scripture I read in James 3 and 1, it says this, none of us is perfectly qualified to be a leader. Nobody's perfect. Nobody here is perfect. I know there's a few people you may think is perfect. They're not. None of us are perfect to be qualified. So that means for every person here that's got some flaws, you're exactly what the Lord's looking for. You're exactly what he's needing to be. 
He says, well, I can't be a leader because i got a few issues. Come on. We all got issues. It's what the Word of God says. And I thought y'all would be like, whew, I feel better about myself. Acts 3 and 20, it says this, the times of refreshing will come from the presence of the Lord. That's why we praise and worship and the presence of the Lord comes because He loves His children. And it's a time of refreshing because it's like this. When my girls, Malachi and Judah, come to me, and they're just like, Dad, we just love you, and they just stretch out their arms, and I just pick them up. They're getting something. I mean, this is how daddies are. They just give their kids something. And it's because they just come and just hug on me and love on me. I want to do something for them. That's how worship is. We start loving on our Heavenly Father. He can't resist us. That's why he made us. But he just comes down and just loves on us. And sometimes, manly men, we need love too. You know, we're like, oh, I'm good. That's after getting, getting it on in worship. You know, sometimes you just need to get lost. You just need to just get down on your knees. You just need to worship the Lord. And Jeremiah 23, 29, it says this. Is not my word like a fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces? Let me break that down. The word of the Lord is like a fire, and that fire should be in you. When you get the word of God inside of you, it is like a fire. And when it is shut up inside of you, you're walking around to that person on your job or that person at school or, that, or you're somebody in your family, your mom or your dad or whoever, and, and they've got a, their heart is like a rock. You just say, that rock has nothing on Jesus, and you just start spitting the word at them. And all of a sudden, that rock inside their heart is going to break. I've seen the hardest-hearted people break under the power of the Lord, cry and weep profusely and completely give their life over to Jesus. Some of the, the, what the world calls manly men, I've seen them break down under the power of God and now be some of those godly men that I know. When you get that word inside of you, when you know the word, man, you can change lives through it. Jeremiah 20 says this, But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones, and I was weary of holding it back, and I cannot any, any longer. How many of you feel like that? Deep down inside of your life, the Word of God is in you so much that sometimes you can't even sleep. Sometimes you can't even control yourself because you get so fired up with the things of the Lord, you've got to tell somebody about them. If you read the Word of God and you start to pray and you seek the, the Lord on a daily basis, you've got to tell somebody about them. Arthur Wallace says this, Find out what God is doing in your generation and completely throw your life into it. Many years ago, probably about 9 or 10 years ago, I remember I was, I was praying by myself. And I said, God, I want a life calling. Right now, I want to be called to something for the rest of my life. And the Lord gave me your generation. And he said, I want you to throw your life into it. And so a little while longer, my wife and I were praying, God, we'll go anywhere. Send us. And he goes, okay, Liberty, Texas, go. And we went. Walmart shuts down at 8 o'clock at night. Are you serious? And, I mean, we went. The mosquitoes were like, boom. And, you know, it was, it, was, it was the best of times, but it was the worst of times. It rained the first, I don't know, 30 days we were there, and it was humid. And the whole time we were there, two people took us out to, to dinner. We really didn't have any friends. We had Jesus and each other. It's enough for me. And, you know, it was a time that we just did what the Lord had. But during this time, I learned to fast. I learned how to read the, the Word like never before. I learned how to pray. The ministry we're in, uh, like if we were doing a conference, we were going to these huge prayer meetings. We had to pray on four-hour shifts. You know, like, and the guys had to take midnight to 4 a.m. or 4 a.m. to 8 a.m. And we just learned to pray and seek the Lord. So for that year, the Lord taught us so much because of simple obedience. And the Lord brought us back to Texarkana. And how many of you are willing to do that? That you're willing to say, God, wherever you want me to go, I'll go. Because a lot of you, you've already got your, your decisions made up where you're going to college. You've got your decisions of what you're going to do. If the Lord speaks to your heart, what would you do? I did this one time at a, a service that we were at with this ministry in Houston. And there's people that had their lives planned out. Their parents had their lives planned out. And it changed in instance. Hate mail. A lot of people were upset. A lot of parents were upset. A lot of school officials were upset. Because people said, the Lord spoke to my heart. And I'm going to do something different. And the people that did that, their lives are radically changed from this day because they made it in an instance they said God I'll do anything and everything that you've asked me to do I told the Lord one time I said God I want to be a man who's obedient on my tombstone there's one word to describe Joe Bradley Dawson I want it to be the word obedient and I want it to be said of me that if the Lord asked me to ever do anything I did it no matter how big or how, how small it was and that's what you should always want to be 
And you know, Psalms 37, 7 says this, Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for Him to act. What that means is you get along with the Lord, and you know you can be along with the Lord with a hundred people. You can be along with the Lord with a thousand people. I was at a call one time with fifty thousand people, and I thought it was me and Jesus that's been in a long time with each other. You get alone, you say, "God, this is what's going on in my life," and you take a deep breath and say, "God, I know Your voice speak to me," and you wait upon the Lord to act, because His Word says, "Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait on Him to act," and He'll act on your behalf. Now, what I want us to do tonight is I want us to honestly ask, who's willing to throw your life into your generation to the things of the Lord? And I can't, I have no idea what the Lord's going to speak to you, but we're going to make this bold, and I'm going to make this real, and do, okay, here's the thing, I'm going to give you a warning, warning, if you respond to this, and you're not serious, and the Lord's laid something on your heart for you to do, and you don't do it, every day the rest of your life you're going to be thinking about it every day only the serious ones need to apply for this how many people in here will honestly say oh it is the most rewarding thing you'll ever do I promise you that the Lord even gave me the courage to ask my wife out it's working out good so the thing is I want you to say God I'll do anything you ask me to do I'll go anywhere whatever you want Lord if you will honestly accept that to be like a life calling always be obedient to the will of God with every eye open and everybody sitting down, I want you to stand up, find your place on this rug, and just at, be still in the presence of the Lord and allow Him to act.